Right, good morning everyone and a very big welcome to our morning service. Uh, this morning, as you're probably aware, we're continuing in our series on the Psalms. And this morning we're going to look at Psalm 30, which is a psalm of giving thanks, giving praise to God through our experiences. So we'll look at that a bit later. But we're going to start off with this morning by singing together, My heart is filled with thankfulness to him who bore my pain. So let's join and sing this together. My heart is filled with the coolness to him who bore my pain, who clung the depths of my disgrace and gave me Shall we go together and speak to God in prayer? Our Father, as we come into your presence this morning, we do indeed come with thankful hearts. And Father, as we pause and reflect upon our lives, we realise there is so much that we have to thank you for. We thank you, Lord, for the everyday blessings, the blessings of a home, of food, of clothes to wear, of all the basic necessities in life. Lord, forgive us when we take these for granted. We realise there are many people in many parts of the world who are denied these things, who are struggling just to survive. And as we thank you for providing for us, we would pray for such as these, that their needs may be met and they may have what is really just basic necessities. But we thank you too, Father, for all that we have above and beyond the basics. And above all else, Father, we thank you for that great love that you have shown to us. A love that provides for our every need. And a love that has met our eternal need in the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, Father, we pray that we might never take this for granted. We might never treat it with indifference or apathy but that we might appreciate the greatness of the love that has been shown to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, as we come to you this morning, we pray that you would draw near to each one of us as we gather here. Lord, open your word to us, we pray. May, as we look at these words written by David so many centuries ago, we pray that their relevance might become real to us and that we, from our hearts, may 
offer unfeigned worship and praise and thanksgiving to you for all that you are and for all that you have done. Lord, we do pray for those here who are going through difficult times. And sometimes, Father, in those times we don't always feel like praising or giving thanks. Lord, help us to see past the trials, past the difficulties, and see that underneath your will is perfect and that you order all things for our good. Help us to see the goodness in the problems and help us to have hearts that are thankful and filled with praise. And so, Lord, we commit this time to you. We pray that you would open our understanding, that your Holy Spirit might speak to us. And we commit this time into your hand, in the name of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Now, Mary, a question. You're the only younger one here, so I'm going to ask you. Do you know what a psalm is, Mary? Do you know what a psalm is? Now, let me tell you, it's a song. You know, we have hymn books, and some are using hymn books, and we put hymns up on the screen. Well, back in the days of the Old Testament, hundreds of years ago, people used to write psalms, we called them, and they used to sing them. And we've got a short video now about one of the psalms. So, if you watch there, thank you, Dean. The man whom God had chosen to rule as king over Israel had disobeyed God's commandments, which displeased the Lord. God had rejected Saul as king, and he had found someone else to fill the role. God spoke to his prophet Samuel and told him to go to Jesse of Bethlehem because God had chosen one of his sons to be the next king. But Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. The Lord said, Take a cow with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse and his sons to the sacrifice, and I will show you which of his sons to anoint as the new king. Samuel set out for Bethlehem, and when he arrived there, the town's elders met him. Fearful of the reason for Samuel's visit, they asked him, Do you come in peace? Samuel replied, Yes, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he dedicated Jesse and his sons to the Lord and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Jesse's son Eliab and thought, Surely this is the man the Lord sent me to anoint as the king. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance. I do not look at people based on outward appearance. I look at the heart. Jesse called seven of his sons to pass in front of Samuel, and each time Samuel said that this was not the son God had chosen. Samuel asked Jesse, Are these all of your sons? Jesse replied that his youngest son was out tending the sheep. Samuel said, Send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. Jesse sent for his youngest son, David, and had him brought before Samuel. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said to Samuel, Rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then left and went to Ramah. Oops. Thanks, Dean. <laughs> Sorry, deliberate mistake there. I, I thought we were using another video, not that one. That wasn't about the Psalms. That was about somebody who wrote a lot of the Psalms. His name was David. Have you ever heard of David? Mm. Can you remember the big giant that David fought? Called Goliath? We might have that some other time. Um, David was a shepherd boy and, you know, one of the most well-known of the Psalms, Psalm 23, 
is when David, who knew all about sheep and looking after them, could say, the Lord is my shepherd. But David was also a king and he went through some really difficult times. And the psalm we're looking at today is one of his psalms when he'd been through a really difficult time in his life. And God helped him. But we'll come to that later. Before we do that, we're going to sing another song together. And that's, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for loving me. Psalm 30. Perhaps it might be a good idea just to read the psalm first. It's on the screen if you want to follow there. Or if you want to follow in your own Bible, that's fine. It's attributed to David, and he writes these words. I will exalt you, you Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths, and did not let my enemies gloat over me. Lord my God, I called to you for help, and you healed me. You, Lord, brought me up from the realm of the dead. You spared me from going down to the pit. Sing the praises of the Lord, you, his faithful people. Praise his holy name. For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favour lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. When I felt secure, I said, I will never be forsaken, I will never be shaken. Lord, when you favoured me, you made my royal mountain stand firm. But when you hid your face, I was dismayed. To you, Lord, I called. To the Lord, I cried for mercy. What is gained if I am silenced, if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it proclaim your faithfulness? Hear, Lord, and be merciful to me. Lord, be my help. You turned my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy, that my heart may sing your praises and not be silent. Lord, my God, I will praise you forever.
May God bless his word to us this morning. Psalm 30. The theme of the, of the psalm is, I will give thanks to you forever. And it's a good thing to give thanks to God. There are so many reasons we can be thankful. And yet as we look through this psalm, it's a psalm of contrasts. And David uses words so cleverly as he balances out opposites. And we'll look at those as we go through. But let's just look at the outline to the psalm first of all. The first three verses are praise from the lips of David for deliverance that he has experienced. Now we don't know what that is all about. We know a lot of the life of David from the books of Samuel and Kings and Chronicles a certain amount. But we're not told what this instance was. It would seem it might have been some sort of illness, a serious illness, that God had brought him through. But we don't know for detail. And I've put there, compare Paul's thorn in the flesh. If we go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and we'll look briefly at that later. But there Paul speaks about a thorn in his flesh that God had given him. To keep him humble, to stop him becoming conceited or exalted within himself and we're not told what that was and it's been said often that it's good that we don't know because you know we all have our different problems we all have our different difficulties that we're trying to cope with in life but David's testimony was you healed me God came through on this and God restored him. And here we have um, a, a contrast that David is bringing out between the gloating enemies and God's love and faithfulness. Let's just go back to that verse that we, um, we the, the opening verse, it says, You did not let my enemies gloat over me. You know, sometimes when we do get ill, the last thing that we want to hear is somebody laughing at us. Somebody making light of what we're going through. And David had many enemies. There were people right throughout his life, beginning with Saul at the beginning who was trying to kill him, right through to the time when he ran away from Absalom. There were people that opposed David and tried to bring him down. And when, when David was going through a difficult time, these people would gloat. But David brings out a lovely contrast here. Although his enemies were gloating and laughing and mocking him, God was there supporting him. And isn't it good to know whatever we go through that God is always there as our faithful God, as one who cares, one who understands and one who is going to bring us through this. Now, as I say, uh, we're not told what David was going through here. But God does deliver us from problems. But that deliverance can come for in many different forms it can be illness and from time to time we go through illness or periods of health problems sometimes it can be serious sometimes it can be life-changing sometimes it can be difficult to cope with and you may ask how can I cope and is that longing to be healed Sometimes it can be danger. And David saw his fair share of this. More than once he was running for his life. People were pursuing him, wanting to kill him. Sometimes our lives can be in danger for different reasons. It can be financial problems or work problems. Or things that are outside our control. 
probably the greatest deliverance that we can experience at the hand of God is that of salvation for that's our biggest danger our eternal state and God has provided for that and God can come in in every circumstance and bring us out of it but he doesn't always do that here David says you healed me whatever the problem was God sorted it out and David came out of that problem it was something that he recovered from but that doesn't always happen sometimes we're in illness and there doesn't seem a way out it has life-changing effects and we go on and on wondering how we can cope sometimes you might be in a work situation or a financial situation or a family situation and there doesn't seem to be any way out and we pray about it and we ask God to provide the answer and it doesn't come does that mean God doesn't care does that mean God has left us and turned his back and walked away no you see there is a verse in the book of Romans Romans chapter 8 and there Paul says we know that all things work together for good to those that love God who are the called according to his purpose can we really get hold of that can we say with assurance that all things work together for good when serious illness comes cancer stroke MS things that change our lives radically can we say that God is using that for our good yes we can there's a song I came across some years back and it's become a favourite of mine. We don't sing it here. We, we did listen to it once. It's by, by an American group of brothers. That's brothers as in born into the same family, not brothers in Christ. Um, and it's called, he, Sometimes He Calms the Storm. And it goes like this, it says, sometimes he calms the storm with a whispered, peace be still. He can settle any storm, but it doesn't mean he will. Sometimes he holds us close and lets the winds and waves blow wild. Sometimes he calms the storm, other times he calms his child. And sometimes God allows us to go through difficulties with no obvious way out because he wants us to draw close to him, to know his protecting love, to know his strength, to know his grace. I spoke about Paul's thorn in the flesh. And again, we're not told what that thorn in the flesh was. But Paul prayed three times that God would take it away. I think I said it before, you can almost imagine how Paul prayed and Paul was a man of prayer. Paul was a man of God. He was close to the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet his prayers weren't answered. God didn't take it away. The answer that God gave was, my grace is enough for you. And Paul says, I will glory in my weakness. We'll come back to that passage later. Sometimes we need deliver deliverance from different things. Sometimes God delivers us out of them. Sometimes God takes us through them. Sometimes we have to walk the dark valley. But he is there. And I can remember some dark valleys I have walked. And it's only looking back I can appreciate the real love and grace and love of God. The power 
of his presence, the assurance of his grace. Sometimes it's only looking back we can understand. But what we do need to remember, we need to appreciate the extent of our problem, but we need to remember the greatness of his power, that our God is able. He can and will bring us through it. And it may not be until we stand in his presence in eternity that we can look back and fully understand why God allowed those things to happen. You know, back in the Old Testament, there's a man called Job, and he was called to suffer things that were just out of this world. They were so bad. He lost everything materially. He lost his family. He lost his health. But he was never told why. But God had a purpose, and he brought him through and blessed him more at the end than he was at the beginning. But that's another story. David could say, you healed me. And David's heart is full of praise as he remembers his God and his power. But then David changes the, the attention in verses 4 through to 5. He calls others to praise God. He said, it's not enough that I'm praising God. I want other people to praise him. I want others to appreciate just how much God has done. Let's look at the verses again. Sing the praise of the Lord, you his faithful people. Praise his holy name. <coughs> for his anger lasts for only a moment, but his favour lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. If I can use an old expression, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Things look black now, but there's a light at the end. <coughs> Sometimes that light is a long time coming. I can always remember when we visited Norway, uh, we went on a, a coach tour, and Norway has got a lot of tunnels. And some of them are amazingly long. You know, we go through the tunnels up at Newport, and they're, what, 300 yards long? These went on for miles. And although the tunnels are lit and the lights are flashing past as you drive, you're looking in the distance and there's no glimmer of light there. It seems to be endless. And then suddenly you turn a bend and you're out. It comes just like that. And they told me that all the Norwegian tunnels are built with a bend on the end to stop the, the snow blowing in and blocking the tunnel. It's a way of preventing um, holdups through snowfall. But that light comes very suddenly. And sometimes God brings us out of things very suddenly, unexpectedly. And David brings a contrast here. He speaks about God's anger, God's holiness, but he also speaks about God's mercy. He speaks about the pain of suffering and the joy of deliverance. And you know, when we compare the two, the joy that comes helps us forget the pain that we've gone through. Let's move on, our time is going. Verses 6 to 10, we read about our weakness and God's strength. Um, oh, I've lost where I am here. He says in verse 8, no, sorry, let me just go back for a moment. I've got my notes muddled up. Oh, here we are. Um, verse 6, when I felt secure, I said, I will never be shaken. Lord, when you favoured me, you made my royal mountain stand firm. But when you hid your face, I was dismayed. Isn't that like us sometimes? We say, I can do it. I can cope. I can handle my life. No matter what life throws at me, I can take it. 
David says, I tried that. When I tried that, I was dismayed. I, I failed. I gave up. But then he said, when you favoured me. Oh, when God steps in. When God is there for us and we know his strength, his sufficiency. Then things become real. And again, let's just go back to... Uh, Let's just go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I've alluded to this a couple of times. Let's just read the, the, the words that Paul spoke. He says, Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, he's been speaking about all the privileges he's had, the blessings he's enjoyed, the experience of having a glimpse into heaven itself. It's there in the earlier verses. He says, Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in the flesh. A messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. And that was God's answer. Paul, you are going to endure this. But through it, you are going to learn my strength. You are going to learn my power, not yours. And Paul goes on to say, Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecution, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Well, you say it's all very well for Paul to say that. He was the Apostle Paul. He was a giant. He was such a spiritual, godly man. And I'm just me. But that's just it. Paul learned that he wasn't a giant. He wasn't an icon. He was just a man. And God taught him, Paul, it's not you. It's not what you can do. It's not what you are. It's what I can be in you. And you know, that's the reality for our everyday life. It's allowing God to come in and be Lord in our lives. To be like David. To recognise that without him, we cannot do it but to surrender to his will and allow him to be Lord in everything. It's not an easy step. And sometimes we need to be brought face to face with the greatness of God to appreciate his power, his might, his sufficiency and to just step back and say, Lord, it's over to you. You're in control. You know, when we do, that surrender brings such a peace, such a joy, such an assurance of knowing and trusting that God is able to take us through these things and be to us all that we need. It made a difference to David. We come into the last two verses. And I love these two verses. I called it the great transition. The change. Look what David says. You turned my wailing into dancing. Go to the authorised version. It says you turned my mourning into dancing. I like the other one. You see, when we think of mourning, we think of somebody sitting down with their head in their hands, ignoring everyone, just wanting to be left alone. And that can be us sometimes, can't it? This is a step up. This was the Middle East morning where they would make a big show of it. They would wail and howl and show that they were really miserable, that they really had felt loss. They let their emotions out. David says, you turn that into dancing. I don't know about you. I I'm not a dancer. You know, when we go to wedding dues and they have a dance at the end, I'm just sitting on the side. You won't get me on the dance floor. Unless 
it's a Kaylee. Then you can't get me off the dance floor. I do like a good Kaylee, it's good. We're going to a wedding in two weeks' time and they got a Kaylee at the end. I can't wait. <laughs> But you know, what is dance? It's an expression of our inner feelings. We can let, thing, let everything come out. The old expression, let your hair down. David says, that's what you've done for me. He says, you've turned my mourning into dancing. We only read about David dancing once in scripture. And that's when they were bringing the ark up to bring it back to where it belonged. It had been captured by the Philistines. And although they had tried on a previous occasion to bring it up, things had gone badly wrong. Somebody had died because of it. And now David is doing it the right way. He's doing it God's way. And we read, as the ark is brought into the place where it belongs, David danced. He'd taken off his royal clothes and he'd put on a plain linen garment, an ephod. And he was dancing before the Lord. He was letting all his joy pour out for all to see. But there were opponents. There were critics. The people that said, you shouldn't do that, you're the king. He was his own wife, Michael. As she watched him from the, the, her upper room, she held him in contempt. You're the king of Israel and you're acting like that? David said, I'm dancing to the Lord. I don't care if I'm undignified. I don't care what people think. I want my feelings to come out. Sometimes, you know, we struggle to show our emotions. I do love watching on songs of praise when sometimes they go into, into the, the West Indian churches. And there they're full of enthusiasm and joy. It's, or the African congregations. They seem to be able to express their emotions very easily. I can't do that. I'm a sort of standstill sort of person. But sometimes we need to show people just how joyful we are. If we are joyful. Sometimes we can appear a bit staid. A bit serious. Not David. He danced. He was filled with joy. He goes on to say, My sackcloth, you removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy. Sackcloth, of course, was the garment of sorrow. People put on sackcloth when they were repentant or mourning. When their spirits were low, it was an expression again showing people how they were feeling. David says, you've clothed me with joy. It's not just happiness, it's joyfulness. The Bible speaks to us about how we should clothe ourselves. If we go to Colossians, there Paul says, put off the old things. Envy, anger, pride and all those things. Take off the things that are bad. And clothe yourselves with humility, gentleness. And he goes on to say at the end, above all these things put on love. Let who you are show to others. As people look at us, what do they think of us? What do they think of you and me? Are we just those people that go to Castleton Chapel once a week and come out with long faces? Or are we feeling joy because we've been in the presence of the Lord? We've been worshipping him. We've been remembering him. As we go about our daily lives, does the love of Christ sh shine out to those around us? Are we showing who we are by being who we are? David did. This is perhaps the greatest contrast in the whole of the psalm. For God had taken him out, out of the depths and put him on the mountain top, and he was rejoicing. Does our salvation mean that to us? 
God has taken us out of the pit. He set our feet upon solid rock. He's put a new song in our mouth, a song of praise to our God, as the psalmist says. Let it show. Let people know that you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. As people ask you how you are, it's easy to look on the negative. And tell them all your woes. Why not tell them about the positive? You are loved by God. You are one of his children. He has blessed you. Tell the people what the Lord has done for you. And let your joy shine out. May God bless his word to us this morning. And as we just ponder upon this psalm, may we, like David, be able to say, You've turned my mourning into dancing, taken off my sackcloth and given me a garment of joy. May people see it and come to know our God. We're going to put a, a song on the screen uh, to finish. Uh, if you'd like to join in, please do. We'll remain seated and then uh, our service is over. We'll just close in prayer after the hymn and then we'll have the others back in. Uh, if we can. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. The sun comes up. It's a new day dawn It's time to sing your song again Whatever may pass And whatever lies before me Let me be singing when the evening comes Let's go
Father, we do indeed bless your holy name. And we bow before you with thankful hearts. We thank you, Lord, that you have saved us and brought us into that place of uh, assurance and safety through the Lord Jesus Christ. But thank you, too, that it's not just that, but you have promised to be with us throughout our lives, to support us, to provide for us. We thank you, our God, that all things that happen to us are in your perfect plan. Help us, our God, to see things through your eyes, to appreciate that all things work together for good, to know that your love for us is unfailing and unending. Thank you, Lord, for this time together. Bless us as we separate. Go with us our separate ways. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be our portion now and forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you. May God bless you.